Corey Ten Boom said, Who can add to Christmas? The perfect motive is that God so loved the world. The perfect gift is that he gave his only son. The only requirement is to believe in him. The reward of faith is that you shall have everlasting life. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16 through 25. Now this prophecy referenced here in Matthew 1, 23, that was going to be fulfilled through Joseph and Mary. Prophecy given in Isaiah 7, 14. It was a prophecy given by Isaiah to King Ahaz over 700 years before Christ's birth. On Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Charles Spurgeon notes, Mothers in olden time called their children by names which had meaning in them. They did not give them the names of eminent persons whom they would very likely grow up to hate and wish they never heard of. They had names full of meaning, which recorded some circumstance of their birth. There was Cain. I have gotten a man from the Lord, said his mother, and she called him Cain, that is, gotten or acquired. There was Seth, that is, appointed, for his mother said, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. Noah means rest or comfort. Ishmael was so called by his mother because God had heard her. Isaac was called laughter, because he brought laughter to Abraham's house. Jacob was called the supplanter, or the crafty one, because he would supplant his brother. We might point out many similar instances. Perhaps this, perhaps this custom was a good one amongst the Hebrews, though the peculiar formation of our language might not allow us to do the same, except in a certain measure. We see, therefore, that the Virgin Mary called her son Emmanuel, that there might be a meaning in his name. God with us. My soul, ring these words again. God with us. Oh, it is one of the bells of heaven. Let us strike it yet again. God with us. Oh, it is a stray note from the sonnets of paradise. God with us. Oh, it is the lisping of a seraph. God with us. Oh, it is one of the notes of the singing of Jehovah when he rejoices over his church with singing. God with us. Tell it. Tell it. Tell it. This is the name of him who is born today. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, 
The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Luke chapter 1 verses 26 through 38. And on receiving this news and news from her relative Elizabeth, Mary sung a song. She said, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 55. In Zechariah, the husband of Mary's relative Elizabeth, on the birth of his son, John the Baptist, gives this great prophecy of not just John, but of the Lord also. And he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies, and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So not only is this a great prophecy from Zechariah, but Zechariah is also quoting Old Testament prophecy about the Lord Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, verse 78, where Zechariah says, Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. He's making reference here to Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And there it says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. John Piper speaks on this prophecy, saying, Zechariah alluded to this verse and said that with the coming of Jesus, the day was dawning from on high. The sun of righteousness was rising, and he has been rising all over this world ever since. And one day his rise will reach its noonday brightness, and he will appear in glory, and the final division between the believing and unbelieving will be made. Just one chapter earlier, Malachi prophesied as well about John the Baptist and Jesus. Zechariah acknowledges this as well when he says in Luke chapter 1 verse 76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 through 3 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. 
He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. John Piper again on this says, Here is a prophet writing 450 years before Jesus, but full of expectation that the Messiah is coming. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then in verse, uh, in chapter 3, verse 2, he says, He is like a refiner's fire. And John Piper goes on with Malachi chapter 3. He says, He is a refiner's fire, and that makes all the difference. A refiner's fire does not destroy indiscriminately like a forest fire. A refiner's fire does not consume completely like the fire of an incinerator. A refiner's fire refines. It purifies. It melts down the bars of silver or gold, separates out the impurities that ruin its value, burns them up, and leaves the silver and gold intact. He is like a refiner's fire. And it does say fire. And therefore, purity and holiness will always be a dreadful thing. There will always be a proper fear and trembling in the process of becoming pure. We learn it from the time we are little children. Never play with fire. And it's a good lesson. Therefore, Christianity is never a plaything. And the passion for purity is never flippant. He is like a fire, and fire is serious. You don't fool around with it. But it does say he is like a refiner's fire. And therefore, this is not merely a word of warning, but a tremendous word of hope. The furnace of affliction in the family of God is always for refinement, never for destruction. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph, and the baby lying in manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. And John MacArthur, speaking on this section of scripture, said, In writing this passage, Luke never quotes Micah. He doesn't refer to Micah. But he shows us how God orchestrated the birth of Messiah in Bethlehem, an explicit fulfillment of that prophecy and what really was an amazing work of God. Because if things had gone on normally, Jesus never would have been born in Bethlehem. Mm. He had to be, by word of the prophet, and the veracity of the word of the Bible was at stake. But God did some mighty working to make it happen. 
and exactly and precisely on time. Joseph and Mary were only in Bethlehem for a matter of days. It had to be exactly the days when that child was born. And Luke makes us understand this without ever quoting Micah, because he knows his readers know that passage. He gives us here some profound insight into the fulfillment of Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So like he says, Christ had to come from Bethlehem, as it was prophesied by the prophet Micah. And this is from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, which reads, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And this was the prophecy that was told to King Herod when he requested to know where the Messiah would be born. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is to be born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. John Piper, one last time on this section of scripture. He says, There are at least five truths that Matthew wants us to see in the story about Christ and worship. Number one, Jesus is the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and should be honored as such. Number two, Jesus is to be worshipped not just by Jews, but by all the nations of the world as represented by the wise men from the East. Number three, God wields the universe to make his son known and worshipped. This is his great goal in all things, that his son be known and worshipped. Number four, Jesus is troubling to people who do not want to worship him and brings out opposition for those who do. Number five. Worshiping Jesus means joyfully ascribing authority and dignity to Christ with sacrificial gifts. Now, the prophecies concerning our Lord are plentiful in the Old Testament, and they didn't obviously stop with his birth. And there's too many prophecies to name in this episode, but from the beginning, Jesus Christ was the prophesied Messiah. All the way back from the first book in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 which says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So from the first book all the way until the last book, which we've already mentioned, Malachi chapter 4, and from Psalm 22 to Psalm 110, and everywhere in between, our mm -hmm. Lord's coming, the first advent, was prophesied. So this Christmas, you know, let that be a fountain of hope for you. Regardless of what you're going through, Christ came, fulfilling those prophecies of his first coming, mm -hmm. and with that, giving us hope and faith that his second coming, or the final advent, is ensured as well. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 10 through 13, the Apostle John records the Lord's words. It reads, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of prophecy of this book. The time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy. 
and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming to you soon. Bring ye, my, bring ye my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So this year, regardless of what the evil one has thrown at you, has been a good year, because it is a year that God has been in complete and total control. We don't always see that, and we don't always want to acknowledge that, especially when bad happens. But we have to be grounded in the truth the Apostle Paul shared with us. And we know that though, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. From Romans 8, 28. So as we look to end this Christmas episode, I just want to read from one of Christianity's most well-known devotionals. Uh, Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. On December 25th, he writes, His birth and history, that Holy One is to be born, will be called the Son of God. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Jesus Christ was born into this world, not from it. He did not emerge out of history. He came into history from the outside. Jesus Christ is not the best human being the human race can boast of. He is a being for whom the human race can take no credit at all. He is not a man becoming God, but God incarnate. God coming into human flesh from outside it. His life is the highest and holiest and entering through the most humble of doors. Our Lord's birth was an advent, the appearance of God in human form. His birth in me. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Galatians chapter 4 verse 19. Just as our Lord came into human history from outside it, who must also come into me from outside. Have I allowed my personal human life to become a Bethlehem for the Son of God? I cannot enter the realm of the kingdom of God unless I am born again from above by a birth totally unlike physical birth. You must be born again. John chapter 3 verse 7. This is not a command, but a fact based on the authority of God. The evidence of the new, new birth is that I yield myself so completely to God that Christ is formed in me. And once Christ is formed in me, his nature immediately begins to work through me. God evident in the flesh. This is this is what is made so profoundly possible for you and for me through the redemption of man by Jesus Christ. So, well, we do just want to wish you guys a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yeah, Merry Christmas. God bless.